Hello there everyone and welcome to episode 3 of us playing TNO, the Lassies of Europe, which we're playing as Ukraine of course. I'm your host, Mr. Communist Ukraine lover, but the aftermath of animals. A faint hope that Bogdan held, held upon seeing the farmstead in the distance had faded as he got closer. There were signs with each closer step what he would find when he saw the churned mud of tire tracks, dozens of boot, boot prints, the burned fields and the complete lack of life. He probably should have left and saved himself the time, but the choice wasn't his to make. Not when his stomach reminded him that he needed food. And if there was a chance there was some left, he had to take it. In such a sheds and silo first, small as they were, there was almost nothing in them, and what remained was useless. Mostly broken farming tools, torn bags, and rotten straw were all that was left. There was a small chicken coop that was also empty, but with not a single egg or hen to be found. No one had been forced into, uh, and the doorknob not clean off the door itself as Bodon approached. He didn't dwell too long on what had happened to them. The happiest ending was that they hadn't been home at all. He found the home as ransacked as the sheds had been. Plates smashed on the floor, silverware scattered, chairs overturned, and cabinets ripped open. There was all a pack of rabid animals that stormed through. Bodon searched the home as thoroughly as he could in the fading daylight, ignoring the broken picture frames and remain, remaining mementos of whatever had lived here. To his delight, he found a half loaf of bread that had fallen behind a chair. Apparently lost in the frenzy, it was stale, dirty, but better than nothing. With it in hand, the sun failing and falling, he turned quickly left. There was nothing more for them there. Only another monument of war. Pest control. It was about four in the morning when Johan heard a twig snap off in the woods, but no more than a few meters away. He hadn't slept in days, and he was regretting it now as he laid on his back, soaked with the freezing dew. He was chilled to the bone with no fire. He couldn't risk the light and smoke. Perhaps there were a few moments where he'd slipped just below the surface of sleep, experiencing brief dreams of the last few days, the fall of his garrison, the retreat order surely part of a mass surrender. The president had been guarding in flames. His failure to lead his men instead of fleeing when the first statue of Hitler fell to a vengeful bombardment. His men had fly into the forest towards a faraway border that he wasn't even sure existed anymore. And now the logical conclusion. Hushed whispers in the brush, beyond the cover of the ancient forest, as if it was he was surrounded by angry ghosts. His mind scrambled for any kind of option as he was no exorcist. He ached too much to move, his ammunition was spent, his throat begged for water, and he had no plan for the last week apart from the run. Who was there? He croaked in what little, little, little of the local language he knew. We got a live one, shouted a voice, although he could not understand its tongue. I have an officer, I think. The one from that fort, I see him. Or turn another. You all didn't get a chance to respond before there was a deafening crack and the forest floor turned red. Five seconds of pain, then oblivion. The Parsons emerged from the woods, two men and a woman. The woman knelt down and claimed his luger with a smile. Shame we couldn't capture him. I got a better idea. Anybody have a rope? The town's not far. We can make an example of him. Show him what happens to murderers and Red Spring. Yurima Dobrovich and his battalion, after several days of march on foot, had finally entered the capital of Ukraine. It's very hard in Seoul, Kiev, or how the Nazis called it, Kiev. He heard it from, or Kiev. He heard from the his fierce resistance put up by the remnants of the German garrison, but it now seems that all of their forces were fleeing the city. The helicopters constantly launching at the outskirts of the city and flying away to the west were a good sign of that. Some also said that the remaining soldiers and colonizers were on the run, trying to save their life at all costs, or surrendering to the unstoppable wave of Ukrainian fury, just what those son of a guns deserve, thought Yarama. But what did they expect after torturing an entire nation for thirty years? Nevertheless, this was not the main thing, yeah. Seeing the German rule over Ukraine falls a pleasure to Yurima, but like everyone else, he cared most for his compatriots, not the Nazi oppressors, and oh boy, do they treat the for former partisans as heroes. Flowers, praises, hugs, everything. The people who were under the Reich's jackboot for decades were finally free. No more suffering, no more humiliation, no more deep deaths. Deaths, he immediately thought of his father. He was also a partisan, fighting for more uh, than a just brighter future for everyone. Before a Wehrmacht soldier shot him, of course, he thought of his mother, which he left, to avenge his dad and carry on the struggle. Grief was quickly replaced by happiness. With Kiev now free, the world will be so over soon. He'll see her again, and they'll rejoice in the liberation of Ukraine for now, though he thought he just needed a rest, and immediately he saw a gathering of soldiers singing songs just around the corner. He went there without a single doubt. And we're still finishing up a patriotic fighting army from uh, slaves, and if you want something done soon. But we're doing pretty well overall. Um, we're pushing pretty hard into uh, the fake Ukraine, and we're doing pretty decently. Uh, also, we turned our all of our militia into normal infantry, fighting infantry, which we had the resources to do, so except for anti-air, anti-tank, but also, you know... Oh, and they are... they don't like what we're doing right now. Oh, good, oh god. That's alright. So, we've taken about 5,000... 6,000 casualties from these guys. All well, the 23,000 to them. Which is pretty good. Pretty decent overall. Um, snap the wires and cut the fuses are probably what we're going to do next. But happy March, everybody. We've got plenty of energy now. We need more production units, but whatever. Uh, if the might of the old Soviet Union had anything over the Reich, it was a talent for a subterfuge. The saboteurs and spy rings of the Kremlin were among the best in the world, who those methodology can be replicated for similar tactics against the present German enemy. Like Skomasarats were already the very embodiment of the mismanagement and neglect, even but well before the outbreak of the Civil War. The holes in the German built infrastructure are just waiting to be exploited. A trigger a sniped uh, a snipped telegraph wire here, a missing supply truck there. Even the strongest chain has a weak point and we just know where to wield the cutter. My god, have we gone far?
Glimmer of Hope, if you want to read this, please read it. Small step, but a step. Available increase in food stocks. Fantastic. We're getting close to Pinsk. Well, that'd just really be dandy, wouldn't it? They're attacking us. Oh, and there goes Nixon. Goodbye, Nixon. Better luck next time, man. We're doing really well. What was left behind? The Van Nordens. Oh, actually, I've read this one before, I think. But, you know, I'll worry him anyways. The Van Nordens were hardly the only family who had to flee Kiev. And Peter spent a long day dealing with a very overworked German official to give them an official place of residence. By the end of the event, though, the official had practically shoved the residence papers into his hands without so much as giving directions. The disrespect chafed at him, but at this point he just wanted to settle down. The papers had calmed him, and they would do it his way until the Germans got their act together and crushed his partisans. They eventually reached their apartment. Peter wrinkled his nose at the smell of the city and noticed that the apartment was not exactly new. He failed to see the dismay in the eyes of his wife and son and as they entered the dreary apartment of only a couple rooms, all of them in poor condition. His wife opened the window to bring in some air as they began to unpack as Peter took out his belongings. He noticed something missing that alarmed him. My medals! He quickly turned to Anatonia. Frantically, you saw my medals? I know I grabbed them. The entire family quickly began searching for them. Peter searched through all they had frantically, refusing to accept that they weren't there. No, no, no. He couldn't have forgot them. Alarm turned to fear, and fear to horror as he realized that if the Ukrainian barbarians looted his home, they would find them, or worse, wear them. The image of some filthy, toothless Ukrainian wearing his medals in a mockery to a service made him feel ill. He breathed heavily as his wife placed a hand on his shoulder, speaking comforting things to him as to try and calm him down while his son stayed in the corner, not wanting him to come closer. He barely heard the comforts of his wife, thinking only of what had been lost, and he could only hope for a miracle. My god. Oh, hey, look at that. 50,000 casualties. Oh, the resistance prevails in Britain. There's only front line, Fritz. With the Germans so obsessed with securing Ukraine for the decrypt colonial empire, it's deeply ironic that the single most effective weapon against Nazis is the land itself. The sheer size of the region combined with its mostly flat terrain creates a front line that reminds one of the First World War, where there's seemingly always more and more of a line to defend no matter how far a trench is dug. Meanwhile, partisans align with their cause attack. The German supplies behind the enemy lines and private the hunt of crucial resources. The cracks in the German lines are already forming, exposing routes to the supply lines to be harried by our militias. While the dear depot is under siege, we will observe the Wehrmacht of the weapons and ammo needed to fight. Even though the Germans are not, no, no longer a problem. The only problem we have are other fellow wrong Ukrainians. And then we'll form the militias next. The remnants of the Ukrainian Red Army are ranks among the best fighting forces in the world, much like their former comrades in Russia. Between the long march of the East and decades spent subverting Nazi rule in the region, time and experience has forged them into a nigh unbreakable fighting force. Time is not on our side, however, for the youngest of our small group of fighting men are aged in their mid to late 40s and upwards. It's not conductive for the longevity of an ar any army, never mind under the crushing pressures of ours is to see the Wehrmacht defeated. The only other option is to shore up our front lines with the Ukrainian people themselves, the very lifeblood of the revolution, as. <clears throat> That is our reason for fighting. They might be as untrained for modern war as they are terrified of the German across no man's land, but they know the score as well as we do, and the terrible price we would have to be made to pay if we fail. How are we looking now? That's fine. Ah, that's our capital now, huh? Interesting. Well, we delivered quite a few thousand casualties to them. Fighting Filipino, huh? Fantastic. Great blow to the rising sun, but that's not our problem. Good. Thermopole. How much more strength do they have? I can't imagine they can fight for that much longer. Not yet perished. Inefficient supply management, huh? Scraps of the pipeline. Formalized officer corps, a bitter harvest famine. Well, hey, that's looking pretty good. 1922 once more. 20 years, a full generation of Ukrainian boys and girls raised under the jackboot, lost in the endless search for an identity of their own, the city called home. A full generation subject to the calamity of national socialism or the German menace, carrying the trauma that runs through each and every household. This will be the case no more. At last, the lands along the Nip are freed from the shackles of subjugation, and the torture revolution is here to guide them. Thanks to Roberts, the people of Ukraine have finally been allowed of the breathing room we have been deprived of for too long, and now it's time to rebuild, rebuild culture, happiness, and solidarity. It's 1922 once again. It's time for the Ukrainian Spring. Nice. Very uh, triumphal. Decrease the liquid reserves. 
authority raised. Monthly poverty rate. Ooh. Monopoly of violence will be added to a sort of laws. The lingering presence of the EPA and UNRA will be destroyed. Cores with the EPA and UNRA will be removed for all but the strongest strongholds. Though the Nazi harbinger of death has been excised, the Grim Reaper of old continues to collect his harvests all across the country. The disease rocking the cities, famine and starvation in the countryside, and rebel holdouts scattered across the country continue to take thousands of Ukrainian lives as the weeks drag on. How can we claim to fight on behalf of the people when such injustices still rage on? Enough is enough. It's time we put an end to this madness, lest we lose the confidence of our people that we have so fought so valiantly for. The past burns. Normally, excursions into a town were a standard chore for Halunya, ne necessary from town to town to acquire those things from the farm cannot provide. This time was different, though. She hadn't seen the UNRA attack personally, but she had heard the outcome whispered by her fellow farmhands. And discussed by her husband and her friends over cards, the town had been liberated. German garrisons far from their home could put up a little fight. Today, one could see the scars of that battle clear as day. Burnt homes, covered bodies, and the ruins of the local fountain left broken in half by a tank fire. Yet, just next to the rubble was a burning pile of objects surrounded by soldiers and local Ukrainians. As how did the rush to see what it was? She recognized a wooden swastika and saw by the Nazis in the center of town. Already black and one arm crumbled and fell. How warm this fire feels, how did thought to herself. How lucky I am to be alive today. How I wish my husband could understand this feeling. Blue and yellow torn in half. With every step, Ivan just wanted to fall into the dirt and stay there. Every wound he had ever er, ached. His uniform, once a rugged yet proud guard marking him as a nationalist parson, was a costume of rags marking him as a traitor in the dark. He navigated solely by the stick in his hand to avoid stepping through barbed wire of straying the path. His heart pounded, terrified of what lay ahead. He, yet longing drove him forward. His fellow partisans had been run off into the woods by the communists and were content to fight their entire lives. Ivan was not. The Germans were gone and the war over. He just prayed that the Reds would accept his surrender, knowing weeks ago he would have accepted theirs. Sergei knocked on her door before wincing and drawing his hand back. The cuts and bruises on his knuckles and arms remained from the weeks of fighting practically hand to hand in the urban war that ended the popular struggle. A few had healed, but others were fresh from resisting his captors. Imagine surprise when they had held him just for a week and sent him home. After staring at his hand for a solid minute, it occurred to him that nobody had answered. He wondered if she had even lived, or if she knew he had lived, or if she had found someone new, or if. The door swung open and Sergei immediately found himself in her embrace. Somewhere far away, Eeyore's cell door swung open. They found his file. It was only a matter of time. He'd been living in fear ever since they threw him in a dismal prison block with the rest of the collaborators, even despite his service to the resistance. The only thing that hurt more than the beatings was the knowledge he deserved many of them. Every day someone was escorted out to be, ju to be judged and then killed. Humiliated, released, or sent back. It's time, said a voice. He prayed as he was, was, he was bodily dragged out and smelled the smoke of burning fabric somewhere outside. Yellow and blue corners curled, then turned to ash, then buried. Peaceful grass. The forest remained dormant even as Bodan crept along it as an interloper. Trespassing upon an unknown tranquility, managers enjoy in a chaotic land. Yet this intruder was respectful, moving through the foliage without harming a twig. Perhaps this was done out of respect but fear. Exiting from the dense gaps between the trees, Bodan found himself stranded in a glade. It would only be a brief interlude from the covers of greenery that surrounded, if one would leave him feeling exposed, easily captured by the bare eye. As he attempted to move swiftly, his fear took hold of him when he heard the quick rustle of leaves approaching behind him. Don't move. A deep yell. From within the forest, paralyzed Bodan, his brain screamed to him with every fiber of his being, being to run for the hills, but his legs only moved to kneel on the grass, hands above his head. If he attempts any sudden movements, we will open fire. One of them walked into Bodan's line of vision, attired with a plain red band on his arm. Wait. Bodan rapidly fished through his pockets despite his fear, grabbing onto a metal as a parson's weapon strained on him. He returned his hands with airs as the red star slipped into the blades of grass. The parson picked up the keepsake to inspect it. Bodan Antonenko? Bodan nodded, hoping that they would not call him a thief or a liar. You're a hero. That word is what he did not expect for him to be described as. How the heck did you manage to survive so long? Come back with us on the truck. We'll bring you back to civilization. Bodan followed the man back to where he did not know, but it was certainly better than here. There's bite in a bleak world for now. That's looking pretty good. We need all our states, though. I wonder if we can fight the Poles for this. Is Germany still in their, you know, civil war? We have actually managed to be able to do all our stuff, but... The German remnants. After an endless and bitter fight, the sun rises over us. Dawn is breaking. Yet the liberation is not complete until all of Ukraine escapes with the German jackboot. Just to our south, the NSDAP has attempted to assimilate the territories of Kherson and Crimea, amalgamating them into a fictitious Gotland. The words mean nothing against the united feeling of a nation. Those land is ours, it has been for centuries. Our brethren across the Dnieper must be freed and their livelihoods restored. The German sellers, tourists, and profiteers may panic and scatter, but the remaining Ukrainians will finally see peace. We rise across the Dnieper and into history. They have a marine division in Ost Berlin. They look in her eyes. The truck pulled up along this unpaved road leading to the farm. A battalion of some ten or twenty olive colored soldiers climbed out of the compartment and made their way to the home of the Nosenkos. Booking his head out of the porch, Danilo peered his eyes towards the source of the rhythmical stopping of boots and caught sight of the red banner on the truck. The flag was not the same one he'd known twenty years ago, but it was abundantly clear that it was the same people flying it this time. 
national liberation, a new life under communism, even cons conscious enough that the last 20 years to know that there were not only promises untenable under the threat of an inevitably resurgent German hegemon, but that nothing but misery had come from that red same flag he flew it, that it flew over the golden fields of Ukraine. Rather than waste his own time with their dribble, he took his leave and went back inside. Helena, rising from a wooden chair, stood and watched as a band of soldiers approach them. Mesmerized by their dream for a free liberty in Ukraine, she waited as they came to her, bearing pamphlets and gifts. Was it youthful optimism in the young woman leading her team to liberators that convinced her otherwise? The determination in the young leader's gaze was too moving, too powerful was the devotion of these young fighters to the cause that it shook a feeling she had not felt inside her in a very long time. Hope. Ah, oh, there's actually way over there. Victory over failure, life over death. As life flourished across Kiev once more, a very special undertaking was occurring in the officer's ballroom. <clears throat> Amateur deco decorators took it upon themselves to denazify the building and freshen it up with the more appropriate red banners of the UASSR. This place would be as beautiful as it was before the Germans sullied it perfect for the first meeting of the Politburo. Shumsky, Richitetsky, Roz Rozdolsky, Holodnachy, and Zupatenko it had been years since they were able to meet each other without having to fear of uh, having a sniper lodge a bullet into one of their heads. Each one made their way into the makeshift meeting room in due time. For the first time in so long, the only feeling they experienced was pure joy as they embraced one another. Wiping tears from their eyes, they sat down to the meeting, anxious to get the official business out of the way so they could get back to making up for the time spent apart. Only one motion was on the agenda, the dissolution of the Reich Commissariat of Ukraine and the restoration of the Ukrainian Social Soviet Republic. All in favor say aye. A resounding aye came from all city members, all opposed to whom I can't even bringing the drinks. With the business taken care of, one of Shumsky's men brought in an inaugural gift to celebrate the first ever Politburo meeting, a crate of fine whiskey reclaimed from a bureaucrat's manor. Drinks were doled out as all the ministers took one night of rest to celebrate as a reparation for the years of fascism they endured, one in praise of all the revolution they had accomplished, and one for friends who danced the night away. Here all the Union alone. A great deal had happened after the Battle of Kiev. Songs had been sung, pictures had been taken, and the last Hitlerites fled across back across the Ukrainian border. There had been a great deal of parties and celebrations, all of it. Ludmila Pavlachenko had tried to soak in before reality crept in. All across Ukraine, there were cities to repair. There were bombed roads, ruined buildings, hospitals, many still bearing the names of fascists, overflowed with the sick and wounded. From her cramped office of the off the main square, even weeks later, she was still finding remnants of the Nazi administration. She had a good advantage of all the work that needed to be done. Ludmila flexed the muscles in her arm and turned... From her desk towards a window, in the center of the square below stood an empty pedestal, where a Hitler upon a horse had once stood. She smiled, knowing that even with all the work to do, Kiev was at long last free. Ukrainian people no longer lived in fear of systematic annihilation. They no longer trembled beneath a jackboot. In a tough country, she was breathing free for the first time in decades. In her heart, she felt a sense of peace, a sense that she had finally lived up to the promise she made to her husband all those years ago. Ludmilla continued to stare at the square. She did not notice the great bird of prey perched upon the opposite building, the red flesh of some animal in its mouth. The enormous bird seemed to stare at Ludmilla in her tiny office for several moments, scowling, and then it opened its terrible black wings and soared westward away from Ukraine and towards the expanse beyond. There, far beyond Ludmilla's sight, there were things were already moving. A light amid darkness, a ship before the storm. What did I read earlier? I think it was this one. Um... Yeah, though the Nazi harbinger of death has been excised, the grim reaper of the old continues to collect his harvest for all across country. Disease rocking the cities, famine and starvation in the countryside, rebel holdouts scattered across the country continue to take thousands of Ukrainian lives as the weeks drag on. How can we claim to fight on behalf of all the people when such injustice is still rage on? Enough is enough. It's time we put an end to this madness that us we lose confidence over people that we've so violently fought for. Monopoly violence. While our revolutionary struggle to break Ukraine from its chains may be complete, the road to bread and peace is still beset with numerous difficulties. Reaction stalk our lads, ambushing our men, attempting to fight on the name, in the name of the failed cause we've already vanquished. Furthermore, petty bandits have, uh, and criminals continue to spread corruption. The political bureau is unanimous. If we are to create a socialist state, we must exercise, exercise a monopoly on violence as a state to crush all those who wish to subvert our authority. Loyal communists fought and died to lead our party to victory, and we will be spinning on the graves if we do not show these scum who rules them. Guess it's not good. Growth is very bad. Oh boy. But hey, we're doing okay. Paradise lost. Mama, where are they taking us? I turned to clasp her son's hand, a soft from the sweat of anxiety. Marcus, confused though beyond. Uh, the cognitive maturity needed to comprehend the abnormality of the events going on in such extraordinary circumstances. Uh, though vividly aware that Ukraine and thus his home were on fire, never he would find his family at the mercy of these rebels. Here in the internment camp, they were so far from home, so far from safety. The hastily erected swastikas on the walls of the living quarters and stage where the German signage was once nailed clearly identified the site as a former slave camp, though the leaking pipes on the ceiling had active maintenance crews preparing them. From the chatter and murmur from the other captives, it would be made out from the distinctive Germanic tongues of the camp housed Dutch and German farmers just like the Van Nordens themselves. Before his mother could sugarcoat her response with enough white lies to keep Marcus docile, the commissar on the camp gathered the attention of the inmates, announcing a heavily accented German. You're gathered here for until further notice. Well, the lands you once settled have been liberated and are now to be reorganized for denazification. Until we deem it appropriate to release you, you shall remain to be educated. 
Peter's fist was as pale as a ghost. With his mouth came the fatherly and sings pacifying promises that the Vatolan was behind them. It was only a matter of time before the Wehrmacht returned and restored order. That would be rescued. They would be rescued from the clutches of the thugs, yet he could not bring himself to believe it entirely, and soon went silent, leaving Antonia counseling Marcus quietly in Dutch. Peter could only shuffle around the perimeter of the gates, watching the olive men scorn and scout at him as they passed by. It was clear that the only thing keeping his family alive was their status as glorious fire hostages. Though in the back of his mind, he was relieved that they were not the UPA. Nice, we actually did it. And we have Crimea too, so... We have to great Crimea. One, two, three states are now our cores. Crimea, Torres, Herson, Sevastopol. That'd be great. Uh, very Trumpas. Comrade Chumsky will be remembered as one of the biggest heroes in Ukrainian history. With his wise and strong leadership and bravery of our soldiers, the Ukrainian proletariat has defeated the German colonizers and broken free from their chains. To celebrate the liberation of the Ukrainian people, we shall hold a victory march in Kiev for everyone to see uh, victory and immortalize this moment in the history books. No longer Ukrainians will live in fear under the Nazi boot today. We control our own fate. We get the color guard from this one, too. As we do have a nice cup of coffee here, it keeps us warm. And they'll read about uh, anything else? No? Andy Parson campaign. Banish the underworld. Ooh. The Rolling Tide. Restore Ukrainianization. Ukrainian will once again be our language. The Ukrainian flag will be our flag. Ukrainian will be the culture of Ukraine. Feed the masses. Stem the rot. You know what? I'm going to go with the ones that are not poverty focused. Banish the underworld. Let's go with anti partisan campaign next. The war is won, but it's not over. We have reclaimed the cities, we've driven out the Germans, we've brought the UNRA and UPA to their knees, and so yet the latter two persist like darnable cockroaches. In the Transylvania Mountains, they still patrol as if they not already lost. And every day, another supply combo is raided on their winding roads. This needs to end now. The last thing. Ukraine aids is rebels who don't know when to give up are crippling our efforts to rebuild. Luckily, some scrappy traders pretending to be a proper army, no match for our troops. Funded, organized, and leagues better than most capacities, a decent force for men should be able to stomp out their little bush war for good. Our military will set its sights on those terrorists and take them down, of course. Alright, you're really supposed to look decent. Growth is not looking great. Um, we'll see. Taste of felt. The city was small, but the moment Bodan had wandered into it, he instantly felt a difference. Uh, for one, there was no Germans here, and he struggled to recall a time when it had not been his, with this case. Without the presence, everything seemed different. It was lively and hopeful, emotions that had been alien to him for so long. He had been so used to being in the background, an invisible person to the fringes of society. He kept himself a small to avoid the Germans from paying attention, not, like they, not that they looked for people who looked like him, for Ukrainians were subhuman in their eyes. Here, it had, been, it had not been the same, but one of the residents, a middle-aged Ukrainian woman, had spotted him in dirty clothes and missing a few meals and quickly brought him into a small camp for, for refugees. It wasn't the only one to wander in. There were other stragglers who found their way, and while there wasn't a lot, a lot of them got some fresh clothes, water, food, and some com small comforts he previously had a scrounge for. Soldiers watched him closely, but there was surprisingly little suspicion. It was too much for him to deal with after a certain point. But I knew that of all this was temporary, the Germans were going to return, and he couldn't let himself believe things would change. To do so was dangerous, so even if he wished he could uh, embrace the community, he would take him in without question. He didn't deserve it. It should be for someone who truly needed it. He could survive on his own. Uh, he could endure when the jackboot came crashing back down on him. Other people deserve the hope, those who could truly believe it. In the middle of the night, he snuck out of the city and back into the woods. He did not look back, for if he did, he might have changed his mind. Hope was a poison he could not afford. At least we're making money. Gotta get rid of that debt. Uh, we have a planned economy, which makes sense. Knowing us. It's a lot of poverty, though. Hunters in the darkness. Dimitri and Makola. Took a little pressure, pleasure in his work, but this was far from the glorious days of liberating Ukraine from the German dogs. Their work consisted of skulking in the dark, working against their fellow Ukrainians. The Ukrainians who could have fought on the right side of the, in another time, sadly. The traitors of the EPA had chosen to follow the reactionary cause of the grave, and so Dmitry and Mykola were ready to oblige them. I'll take the five on the right, you take the five on the left. Mykola kept his voice hushed out of the paranoia of precaution. Hidden underneath such a dark night, only Dmitry could see him. Don't try anything fancy, we can make our way down to the camp to finish off the fascist traitors. They are ready the rifles and begin tonight's hunt. One, two. The first victims were dropped almost immediately. Three, four, five. The starved soldiers began firing wildly like cornered prey, bullets flying to nowhere. Six, seven. A grateful soul who attempted to flee is put down by one of his own. Nine. An apostle of the UPA takes comfort in knowing that he will soon meet his heroes in heaven. And a half. A banderite will shot his flight as the two hunters descended from the shadows of pursuit. A blood troll gives up the game as his legs have just given up the ghost, crumbling into a heap as the huntsmen close in. 
My call let his comrade finish his kill. He would be glad that the UPA would soon be exterminated, freeing him from the grisly business. Dimitri. Brandish his revolver to the young band that I pleaded with him for mercy that would never come. He pressed his gun to the quarry's skull, pull, pulling the hammer back and squeezing the trigger as he uttered the last two words a teenager would ever hear. Sorry, brother. Stem the rot. To put it lightly, the Rax Commissariat was not particularly interested in maintaining a healthcare system. Decades of deprivation and malnutrition were born fruit. As tough as cholera and influenza have ripped through rural areas, the, the vast majority of uh, medical training reserved for Germans, all of whom, one way or another, are no longer available, we are in a dire situation. We must send anyone with the medical technical training we have on hand out to the villages. Uh, low dime, bandages, clean water, anything of oh, iodine, anything we can scrounge up, we'll have to send out with them. We hope we'll fix this problem in a day, but we can at least alleviate some of the misery. The color guard. Makola would have never believed that the proudest day of his life would be involving him in marching with a Nazi flag, yet here he was, side by side with each of his esteemed comrades as they carried the colors of the fascist occupiers. Flag, standard, and bearers <clears throat> of the hated Reich swung low, meeting the ground with the treads of the captured German tanks rolling alongside them, the hate symbols that once adorned these beasts of war were defaced with red. Makola well, thought about the fascists, that swine that paraded these banners, he hoped every last one of them was six feet under. Yet his say took a second place to his pride. Makola's heart could only swell with emotion as he looked to each side, the men, women, and children that they liberated from the German lines. Germans lined the streets of Kiev, all gathered together to cheer them on for this glorious day. He looked at Comrade Shumsky and his little political bureau watching over him, taking a brief respite from the busy work to oversee his important day. Finally, tossed the enemy's honors that had followed his nation into the pile in the same manner as every other UASSR soldier that was given the privilege of taking part in the ceremony. The crumpled mass sat on the pyre as Mykola watched a veteran of 1923 carry a torch towards the pile. He lowered the flame. As the symbols of hate were incinerated in a purifying flame, never to terrify another innocent soul again, a wave of applause filled the squares. Mykola was satisfied in knowing that even if the Germans were to conquer them once more, they would never be able to reclaim the colors. Artifacts of suffering that deserve to be forgotten. And restore Ukrainianization. <coughs> Since the end of the war. Thousands upon thousands of Germans and Dutch have come to Ukraine, backed by the Wehrmacht's bayonets. They have colonized our land, evicted our people, and invaded our skies and cities. Though many fled during the uprising, many more remain. Our position must be uncompromising. Ukraine is for the Ukrainians and the Ukrainians only. If the colonizers will not flee, then they and their children must learn to live as Ukrainians. Because why not? Happy June! Happy, happy June. Visions of home. Antonia felt the company hear the warm sun fall on her face and heard the sounds of birds in the air. More sounds reached her ears. One of the cities she instinctively knew was in Amsterdam. She slowly became aware that she was floating down one of the canals, but why, she did not know. And she could not move. At first, she was not alarmed. Sedated and covered by both the sun and water, which, the latter of which felt like a protective cocoon as she floated. Above her, she saw the homes and buildings of her childhood home. She saw built people walking down the streets over bridges, smiling, laughing, but seemingly unable to hear her or see her floating by. She tried to call out to them, but her mouth refused to obey. The water began turning colder, and the bright sun became obscured by clouds. The comforting warmth faded, and the rain took its place. The familiar sounds of the city became fainter and were replaced by the sounds of the Ukrainian wild wilderness, interspersed with distant gunshots. She saw a glimpse of Amsterdam behind her becoming smaller and smaller as she swept out into the North Sea. She screamed for help to, uh, to save her from where she was, being dragged into a surprise she was finally able to. Antonia shot up in her bed, panting heavily as the vestiges of the dream faded, and she woke in a small, cramped and cold room which was now their home, an apartment which, with paint chipped off of the walls, uneven floors, and a wet stench that didn't even seem to go away. Their new home. She lay back down, her eyes wet as she struggled to return to sleep. She only wished she was back home. Peace and bread. In these chaotic days of 1917, in those days, Lenin promised the people of Russia three simple things. Peace, bread, and lamb. We reclaimed our land from the German oppressors and giving it back to the people. And now the primary desires left on the minds of the people are peace for the unending violence that has become commonplace in Ukraine and food readily available on their tables. If, if we claim to be representatives of the people, it's our duty to focus on these two matters above all else. Rolling Tide. These stubborn traitors and reactions are nothing if not stubborn. They refuse to accept their defeat even at the end of a bayonet and remain in the hills, mountains, forests, and fields. They take advantage of lawless lands, hold on tight to their rebel victims, or simply live like glorified bandits as they had long before the war. Luckily, they are equipped for this. With the guns, bombs, tanks, and revolutionary will, We'll root out these dangerous relics of the past wars. Our bases in Donbass will be of particular use with those qualities in spades. Our mighty army will roll west by foot, truck, or tank and reclaim our nation. <coughs> uh, results of the census will take time to progress. As census progresses, control in all regions will rise. Weber Galicia. Ooh. 
Issue one, census first. Between the occupation and the war and ongoing reconstruction, Ukraine's lost untold lives. Beyond the moral ramifications, a practical result of this is that rebuilding will be an arduous and difficult process. In order to make ourselves a truly communist state, we'll need every set of hands we can get, and we simply can't, don't know how many there are at our disposal. Records have been burned, graves lay unmarked, and hundreds of two thousands of soldiers have unmarked uncertain MIA status. We'll have to set to work taking stock, figuring out just how many we've lost and the help the living can lend to our cause. On top of that, this helps organize the state and even have the morale benefit of bringing closure, even reuniting to the families of the dead and missing. The cost. The first weeks have been filled with hope for Holland and Daniel. Then the reality began to sink in. No, no war, no matter how right or justice, comes without a cost. For the Nosenkos, they paid that in food stamps, foodstuffs, and supplies. Uh, the Nosenkos had relied on a broken, exploitive economy, but in the harsh center of war, there was no economy. They simply had to fend for themselves. And so, in the quiet, dark end of the growing season, the two sat around the table and marked off rations, quietly considering what they'd left. For hours, they methodically marked off what they'd gathered this season and for how long it would need to last. And then an odd comfort came from Daniela as a slip of the tongue, I hope this is all worth it. How Nia looked up from her work indignant. You know, you must know it is. Daniel shook his head. I do not have hope, but I know nothing. Hanya put her notes down and turned to Daniel, her eyes burning with an intensity that cut through the darkness. If we died tomorrow, then we, it still would have been worth it. The room was silent for a moment. I don't want you to die. For this, or for anything. Why do you attempt tax cuts? <laughs> Liberate Galicia to the front comrades. The perfidious Polish rump state and his reactionary arrogance has refused to return our rifle territory Galicia, but we will not abandon our fellow Ukrainians to the jackboots. The Red Army is being mobilized to the borders of the occupied territories. We'll give the Poles one last chance to accept our demands and return what is rightfully ours. Should they remain defiant, we will reclaim Galicia by force. Returning home, Yaroslava Dobrovich was once again watering the flowers in her garden. On one half, she planted chrysanthemums after her husband died at the hands of the Germans. On the other, she had planted irises after her eldest son, Yurima, joined the largest uprising Ukraine had ever seen. They reminded her of her son and husband, of what her loved ones had fought for years ago, and what her son was fighting for now, at that moment. The Yaroslava began to wonder if her son was doing fine. She hadn't heard anything from him for the past two or even three months, which caused worrisome thoughts to enter her mind, but she somehow managed to push him aside, just as she heard the footsteps behind her. Hold on, Petro, let me finish watering these flowers, he said. Thinking it was a mailman as usual. Surprisingly, there was no response from the usually talkative person. Good God, Petro, can't you hear? Hello, Mum. There stood her son, Yarima, with a mustache and a scar on his face, holding a basket filled with various food items, tomatoes, cucumbers, bread, and more. I, well, I thought it would be a good idea to bring some food here. He spoke in a calm yet somewhat awkward tone. Before he could say another word, Yarima Slava came running to him, tears of joy streaming down her face. She hugged him like she never hugged anyone else. Yeah, he just made it back. What is but another war? They will, they, it's likely they will not accept. Oh, they really don't like us. Paternalism, huh? Oh, we can't even improve relations. One million is a statistic. At Chimsky's request, uh, provisional data from the fastest reporting of Ukrainian or Ukraine's census districts were forwarded to him. The information was sorely needed. The government was effectively groping around blindly without a clue of the... Uh, oh, look at that true state of the country. Even such a basic statistic as the number of people in the countryside evaded them, beyond the loosest estimates. But the arrival of the census data brought no relief. Things were far worse than they'd imagined. Famine, war, oh. and disease had torn the Ukrainian population to ribbons. Standards of living were had regressed to those in the Tsar's time. National income and wealth had collapsed. Property damage was extensive and would probably take decades to restore entirely. Some rural areas had all but returned to pre-industrial life, with the agricultural capital almost non-existent, and the urban manufacturing base was not exactly about to make up for the shortfall anytime soon. This posed the largest problem. Ukraine needed food, both for its people and for export. Once the extent of the disaster had been confirmed, Shumsky decided that it was pointless to waste for the rest of the data to come in. The government had to act now and act decisively. Hordes of party cottages would need to be dispatched throughout the country to salvage what they could in terms of agricultural equipment, fertilizers, and other necessities. If Ukraine's long-suffering agricultural sector was to be saved, drastic measures would need to be taken. None can live without food. An empty execution. It was a miserable day. The overcast clouds darkened the woods, threatening to rain again as air grew cooler. Colder. Uh, sharp wind cut through the evening coats, and muck and mud clung to boots and clothes. A Baldan observed the soldier from within these woods, watching as he stumbled along the turn-up road. He didn't know where the soldier had come from, but it was unmistakably a German. The uniforms were easy to identify, even though it was a torn and grime that covered it. The man was in poor shape, his movements were sluggish, his feet dragged, and his back slouched. He held one arm gingerly, with no weapon to be seen. The soldier was young, thin, small, and with sandy hair. Maybe a boy from the invading settlements, maybe a conscript from Germany itself. It didn't matter. Baldan watched silently, his own rifle in hand. He heard the voice of his commander, as clear as the day before his first battle. When the enemy's in your sights, you will not hesitate. You will kill them unless you want them to, d to do the same to us. There was only one fate for the Germans. He mechanically aimed, inhaled, and fired. The soldier fell to the ground with a scream, writhing in agony from the shot to the back. Another shot rang out, and the soldier went still. Baldan only lowered the rifle once he was sure the man was dead. 
He remembered how he felt when he killed his first German. Elation, pride, and satisfaction. He felt none of that now, only cold dispassion. One more German was dead, but there were thousands remaining. A drop in the bucket, but every drop counted. It stripped the body of what little it had, and once more vanished into the woods. It would not be the last German who met such a fate. I don't think they could take us on, really. They might have been born out of the German grip, but... Our soldiers are experienced, and they're actually, like, halfway decent now, so... And we've got 23 divisions of them. Now, we'll be able to beat the Germans? Probably not, but whatever. The rolling tide. Goodbye, JK. Spring turns to summer. When we liberate our homeland from the Germans, our people enjoyed a sense of optimism and unity not seen since 1917. However, war drums are beating the West, and even our children know what is coming. The National Socialist Nightmares marching east, and the cacophony of their war machines heralds the end of our country's spring. A summer of hard work and turmoil is upon us. For every Ukrainian man, woman, and child must prepare for the coming storm, and some. So come now, comrades, for now, more than ever, it's time for us to unite and to stand defiant. The Germans wish to slaughter our guardians and shed our laborers and enslave their survivors, but we will break their hordes. We must, for a defeat would mean the death of our revolution, homeland, and civilization. Authority be raised, trust be raised, desolation in every region falls by nine. As the dark clouds gather over the land once more, our newfound optimism fades as old cracks reemerge. Yet, in spite of this, we must continue pushing forward and weather the storm that is approaching. Ultimatum. Chomsky would have been happier if he and the Politburo could meet under more comfortable circumstances, but matters of national integrity were, far, were of the utmost importance. Every man in the room was aware of the tragedy in 1921 when Poland stole Galicia from the nation, separating Ukrainian families from their homeland. There were those who were apprehensive on the matter, not because they believed Galicia belonged to Poland, but because of the committed, combined circumstances of returning Germany and their own war-weary status. Some secretly hoped for an alliance, one that never happened with a reactionary home army in control. These small protests continued with the largest topic of debate, among them being that Ukraine simply could not bear another war, even if they could take on the Polish. Too complex in such quick succession could stretch a burgeoning nation to be the breaking point. Finally, Roman Rozdolski spoke to put an end to the dovish sentiment espoused in the Politburo. I was born and bred in Bogalicia when, when it was stolen by the reactionaries. I continue my struggle with the Communist Party of the Western Ukraine, and only Germany put a temporary halt to my efforts to liberate the province. I can never forgive myself for the rest of this room if we pass up this chance to reclaim what was ours. I wanted to go to the grave knowing that we did the right thing. The words silenced all dissent from this opinion, but to appease those doubts, I decided that Poland would be given ultimatum to surrender Galicia before more martial action would take place. The proposal was passed unanimously as the meeting only was adjourned. Chomsky left with a pessimistic feeling the Poles were too stubborn. He to realize that they were far better equipped to defend Galicia, he just have to wait and see. A Poland confess to the crimes in 1921? We are prepared to move immediately. When all's well, mother, Antonia turned from her seat as a window or his son's voice. Marcus had entered the room, seeing a bit restless and uncomfortable, disturbing her. Even at seven years old, he still hesitated about asking her for something. She smiled at him, letting him know it was okay. Come here, Marcus, what is it? He came closer and sat down beside her, biting his lip before asking, when will we be able to go home? Her chest tightened at the question, one that she did not honestly know when to answer to. Nor where the home even was for them anymore, where they lived in Ukraine, or where they had been happy in the Netherlands. Her smile faltered only slightly as she kept her voice light. When all's well, which will be soon, she promised. And when it is, I'm going to take you to a beautiful place. Do you know Holland? You know where you grew up? She smiled fondly. Yes, a beautiful place with green landscapes, clear streams, clean cities. I can't wait for you to see it for yourself. She leaned into a bit closer, as if sharing a secret. Your father won't admit it, but between us, I think he wanted to visit it too. He smiled at that as if he wanted too to go to a land without trouble. But that was something in a smile that Antonia knew was forced. She painfully knew it was not the first time she'd made such promises in this awful place they were now. Perhaps reality was already coloring her young son's outlook. But if he didn't believe her, he didn't say a word. Come on, Poland. Oh, wow, look at that. Really? Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic actually won. Dmitry Medvedev. One day the full story will be told, the story of millions of souls, each with their own tale. More, the more Europe scars open, the more we will know. How did they get actually, like, how did they do it? How, we, we went comments. I didn't do anything, like, I did not set any, like, direction for anyone to go. Because the West Russian Revolution Front's looking pretty good. We have the Russian the Soviet Federative Socialist Republic. We have the Ukrainian Socialist Soviet Republic. We have the Kazakh Soviet Socialist Republic. Oh my god. Socialist Republic of Turkmenistan? Holy crap. This is a really red Europe. A really red East, really. Oh, Stalker, oh god. Uh. Come on, I, I want just one more war. I know we can't afford it, but still. They're not even going to even attempt to hold on Lviv. Or Lviv. 
Weekly change still going down. Kind of sucks. The red dawn fades. Huh. What is this trust and authority thing? The mountain of radio intelligence reports that covered the Politburo's table have been read over and over again by Shumsky and his ministers, yet the information inside had not, had not changed. The Germans were returning. There was not a single piece of intel that contradicted this simple fact. Every minute they continued the discussion, another German tank arrived at the Polish border, ready to roll across Eastern Europe once more. The power struggle in Germany was coming to an end, and already opportunistic generals sought their place in the sun reconquering the East. The rest of the meeting was spent discussing what could be done. Proposals were suggested regarding partisan networks, battle tactics, and more communism, but it quickly became clear that no one was able to discuss such matters after the latest discourse from the Reich. Everyone bar Shimsky left, Ludum de reconvene later, hoping to spend time with whatever family they had left first. It looked outside of the window at a Kiev hued in an orange sunset. The city ruined. Ruined city was only rebuilding itself now. It took years for it to be restored to its former glory, to be ground down to dust any day now. As Mom was ablaze with the horrors that would befall the Ukrainian people, he wondered how it could be worse than what they already experienced. He touched a glass. As he spotted children playing amongst the rubble, and another time they could have grown up with their parents, gone to school, fallen in love, and raised a happy family before passing away in cozy beds. Shumsky listened to the laughter, but he could only return to a familiar feeling, dread, dread for what was to come. Today the wind is light with jubilation and victory. Tomorrow it'll lay heavy with smoke and blood. You've done all that you can. Victory is what the masses cry. Victory is what the soldiers shout. The victory is what Shumsky announces over the radio as the status of both Erkok and Adolf Hitler are destroyed. But victory cannot be the masses. Victory cannot bring back the dead. Ukraine is wasted and destroyed by war, ravaged by disease. The wounds caused by the hunger plan, plan and the 20 years of genocide run deep. And the idealism of the soldiers and theories of communism cannot heal this. The Germans scorched the earth as they retreated. Burning fields, leveling cities, and blowing dams. Destiny is handed the task of rebuilding Ukraine to the communists. They needed years. They only had months, though. Already German forces regroup and gather, planning the reconquest of Poland, also, and then Ukraine. The year is 1964, and the specter of fascism threatens to swallow Ukraine whole once again. But if you enjoyed this video and this campaign, as I have thoroughly enjoyed it, please consider leaving a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. As communists, we have nothing but a surplus and no debt. And I'll see you tomorrow in another campaign. Thanks for watching. Have a tremendous rest of your day.